Take your Bibles and go to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to pick up where we left off this morning. At times, I, I question the wisdom of putting the sermon outlines in the bulletin. Because then on Sunday morning, people can look at Sunday night sermon and see that I'm preaching. And then they can see that the title of the sermon is The Chastening Hand of God. And they can say, well, I'm out on that deal. And they can stay at home. Sometimes the preview is not good. And, uh, but it's, it's, it is what it is. It is in the scripture. It is next in line. And it is my job uh, to bring a message from Hebrews chapter 12 and beginning in verse 5. Now, today's topic is not a popular topic among Christianity today. today Paul is dealing with people who are experiencing some, some fainting spells because in verse 5 he says, faint not when you're rebuked of God. Now, we don't need to faint when we're rebuked of God, but there are some things to remember that help us not to faint when we are rebuked. Now, we need to understand why people suffer. And I, I think that's one of the great questions of humanity today is why people suffer. And the long and short of it is a lot of suffering is due to the fact that there's sin in this world. And people say, oh, if God loved everybody, wouldn't there be no suffering? Well, people suffer. That's a part of life because we live in a cursed world. We live in a cursed world. We live in a sin-cursed world. But there are many reasons why people suffer. There are natural causes, those sufferings that are common to all men. And then there, are the, the cause of, there is the cause of Christ, and that's suffering persecution uh, that comes at the hands of non-believers against Christianity. Then there's the trials uh, of faith that come in our lives, like with Job. But then you think about people like Jonah. Now, Jonah suffered, but why did Jonah suffer? Jonah suffered because of his disobedience to God. And that's what we're dealing with in our text today. We're dealing with the chastening hand of God against the disobedient child of God. Now, let's look at our text today and, and let's learn some things about God's chastening hand. Look in verse 5 with me. He says, And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children? Now I want you to note something as we read this, and if you uh, are inclined to mark in your Bible, you might underscore this. He said, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. Notice how many times he uses the word son here, because that's going to be important in just a moment. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they, talking about our fleshly fathers, for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up thy hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight the paths of your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Let's go to God in prayer again. Father, we come to you tonight thanking you for your word. And God, it's not always pleasant. And let's just be honest. I mean, we read your word, Father, and sometimes it, it rebukes us. And it, it teaches us things that are not uh, pleasant to our flesh, that are contrary to us. And Father, we thank you for it because we know it is, it is a sharp two-edged sword that divides us asunder. It helps to sharpen us and to mold us and to yield us to you. And Father, as we read your word tonight, may our hearts be yielded to you. May our minds be open to hear. May we receive the words that are given to us. And Father, may it change our lives. May we understand 
that your chastisement doesn't come because you hate us, but because you love us and that you want to correct us. And Father, I would pray that you would search us and try us. Look in us and see if there be any unclean thing in us and may you, may you rebuke us with your word. May our lives be changed so that our lives might bring forth honor and glory. And that Jesus might be lifted up and exalted in our lives. I pray that you bless our church, God, and you bless the reading of your word now. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you notice in our text here that he says about our earthly fathers that that after their own pleasure, they corrected us. Now, that doesn't mean that our fathers enjoyed spanking us. No, no father really enjoys spanking his children. It simply means that the earthly fathers disciplined and corrected their children as it seemed fit to them, as it seemed right, and as it seemed correct. And sometimes fathers make mistakes. Sometimes earthly fathers make mistakes in their discipline of their children. Sometimes we... we wrongfully and unfair, unfairly punish our children. And all the children said amen. But there are many times when children get away with things that they should have been punished for. I mean, how many times in your childhood can you think back and you know you, know you didn't enjoy the chastisement or the punishment of your parents, but how many times did you get away with things that you should have been whooped for and you should have been corrected for? And so it all begins to even out. But in all of that, He's speaking about the correction of our Heavenly Father. Now, let me say this. God makes no mistakes when it comes to His discipline. His discipline and His chastisement on our lives is never unfair and never undue. It is always, uh, there's always a pure, corrective, beneficial motive behind the chastening, correcting, disciplining hand of God. And when God chastens us, now I want you to take heart in this. If God and when God chastens his child, it ought to be something that helps us to rejoice. Well, I'll take a little comfort in it because that means that God is interested in my life. He's interested in what I'm doing. He still hasn't given up on me. I, I helped coach Jacob's football team from fourth, well, actually from about se second grade on up to this year. And, you know, at church I'm really laid back. But you ought to see me on a football field. Sometimes I get intense. I know y'all don't believe that, but it's true. And I coach with intensity, and sometimes these boys think that I'm yelling at them unfairly. And I tell them, I, I say, listen, if I'm yelling at you, that means I'm interested in you, and I still think that I can use you. And I, I think if I correct you, then you will be beneficial to my cause, which is winning football games. It's in the moments that I stop yelling at you that you ought to be worried because now I've given up on you. And I have no interest. In, I don't even care what you do. I don't even care if you show up on Saturday and play with us. And see, if, if someone's correcting you, that means they're still interested in you. And so when God disciplines his children, you know, we ought to take some heart in that because that means God's interested in what I'm doing. He still believes in me. He still cares for me. And it also tells me that I am his child. And so let's think about the chastening hand of God and think about some, some things regarding that. Think about, first of all, the reasons for chastisement. Now, some people think that only a cruel God would, would punish or discipline his children. That God is some kind of cosmic bully. Uh, only someone like that would discipline his children. But it's actually the opposite of that is true. It is not because God is cruel. It is not because God hates us or despises us that he will correct us. It is actually because God loves us that he corrects us. Check out this verse, Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. Jesus said there in the letters to the churches of Asia Minor in Revelation, he said, Jesus says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. As many as I love. He didn't say, well, because I'm cruel and I can't stand you, I'm going to rebuke and chasten you. He said, no, if I love you, I'm going to rebuke and chasten you. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So he does it because he loves us. And it does so much more for us. His chastisement in our life does more than just prove his love for us. First of all, it confirms our sonship. Our sonship. He does this because we are his children. And when God chastises us, it is proof, it confirms for us our sonship to him, that we actually have a relationship with God. I, I had you to notice in our text 
how many times the word sons is used there. That's important because he's confirming something for us. He's confirming that we are his children. It's as simple as this. Because God fathered us, he loves us. And because he loves us, he will discipline us. The father who loves his children will correct them. It is the father who does not care about his children who lets them run wild and free. It's the father. And hey, listen, if your child disobeys you, you tell your child, you say, child, do not go out into the street and play out there because it's dangerous. If they disobey you and you don't correct and you look up, you see them out on 412 playing around out on 412, and you say, well, I see them out there that disobeyed me, but I love them too much to correct them. You don't actually love them at all. Because if you loved your child, you would see the danger that they're in and you would try to correct your child. It only makes sense. The unloving father does not correct his children. He does not care what happens to his children. He does not care what, uh, what happens in their future. Only the loving father cares enough to discipline and correct his children. God fathered us, therefore he loves us. He loves us, therefore he corrects us. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Now, some people won't chasten their children because they say, I love my children too much to hurt them. And the fact is, and the truth is, they actually love themselves too much to bother with them. Because discipline is hard, isn't it? Discipline requires, discipline of somebody else requires self-discipline. For me to follow through with the things that I would do. The fact is, they love themselves. And if you loved your children, you'll correct them. And God loves his children, amen? And he corrects his children. Do you think that God enjoys disciplining his children? Of course not. But in his wisdom, God knows what is best. And he does what is necessary for us. The Bible says, He that loveth his son chasteneth him, chasteneth him betimes. That word betimes means early. Correction begins early in the child's life so that he does not grow up undisciplined and wild. And friends, God's chastisement will come early. It will come early in the children of God's life. And God is dealing in our lives all the time. Friends, he's not afraid to correct his children. Now, if God is dealing with me and the sin in my life, that's a good sign. His chastisement confirms that I am his child. You notice that he says he deals with his sons. If he's dealing with us, he deals with us as sons. Now, that's good because if I can sin, if I can, if I can lay out a church, if I can never pray, never read my Bible, and, and sin... Uh, willfully all the time and God never deals with me friends that's not a good sign God's going to deal with his children God loves his children too much to allow them to succeed in their sin I remember uh, getting great confirmation you know one of the things that I think a lot of Christians do in their Christian life is sometimes we tend to doubt our salvation let's take a little honesty poll here anybody in here in your lifetime ever doubted your salvation would you be brave enough to raise your hand sure as nearly everybody nearly everybody at some point in their life has come to a place where they say well I I'm reflecting on, on the day that I was saved and did I really know what I was doing and, and was I really saved and and then there are so many people who believe and teach that you can lose your salvation that yeah you're saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ but it's dependent upon you to live a great life in order to keep your salvation as a matter of fact I pastored a church in Eufaula and uh, down the road from me was a church that had a sign out and it said salvation is a free gift but it's up to you to keep it I thought wow what a great gift that was that's what the church sign said so I called the guy up. This is when I was young and brazen. I've mellowed out a lot. I called the guy up down there. I said, could you please change your sign? That heresy is wearing me out. And I have to answer a lot of questions every time my church members drive by it. Well, you, you, you no, listen, I'm saved by grace. I'm kept through faith and kept by grace. And, and friends, it is a gift of God. But there have been times when I doubted my salvation. There have been people who doubt their salvation thinking they can lose it. And I had a friend of mine I was witnessing to after I rededicated my life to God and got back into church. And this friend, he knew all too well the deepest and darkest moments of my life. And I was witnessing to him, trying to get him to come back to church, 
And I wasn't sure if he was a Christian or not. I knew he wasn't in church, and I was trying to witness to him. And he looked at me, and he said, so did you just get saved? Brother Matt, I said, no, I've been saved for a long time. I said, but I, I just rededicated my life to God. I came back and repented and asked God to forgive me, and now I've rededicated my life. He said, what about these years out here that I've known you in all of this, all of this sin? He said, are you telling me that you were saved? Did you believe that you were saved through all that? I said, absolutely. I said, it's never been more clear to me that I was saved during those times. He said, how could you say that? I said, because God, in his infinite wisdom as my heavenly Father, never, never gave me one moment of rest in that time. One moment of rest. He was constantly dealing with me. Why was he dealing with me? Because he deals with those as his sons. It confirmed for me. His, his fatherhood over me and my sonship to him because he didn't let me rest in my sin. He didn't let me succeed in my sin. He was constantly, constantly convicting me by the Holy Spirit. And it confirmed in me later that I was his son because, listen, he dealeth with those as sons. He chastens his sons. And I thought, that's just proof. It's just proof that I was his child all along because he never gave me a moment's rest. He doesn't deal with the, with the devil's children that way. Now, God deals with saved people and lost people, but he deals with them on a different basis. He deals with saved people and lost people on a cash and credit basis. You know what the difference is? Cash is now and immediately. Credit is in the future, and it's usually judgment, right? Amen? So he deals with saved people right now, immediately. Lost people he's going to deal with. Now, he convicts lost people, but he doesn't discipline and correct lost people. He convicts them of sin and tries to draw them to repentance and salvation in Jesus Christ, but he deals in chastisement with his children. So if God's dealing with me, it confirms my sonship. Secondly, it compels our sanctification. Look at verses 10 and 11. Do you know that God does everything for a reason? Everything he does has a purpose, and it is moving purposefully. Look at verse 10. He said, for they verily... For a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. His holiness. Now, listen, friends. Many Christians today are not concerned with being uh, partakers of his holiness. Many Christians today are concerned with their happiness and their healthiness. But, friends, God is far more interested in in our holiness than he is our happiness. Amen? And, and people say, well, does God not want me to be happy? Well, let me tell you something. The person who is holy is happy. Amen? Go to the Sermon on the Mount. Happy, happy, happy. How to live happy right there. He tells us. It's all a part of living like Jesus and being the partakers of his holiness. God does everything for a reason. He said in verse 11, Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. His chastisement not only confirms my sonship, but it compels my sanctification to make me sanctified and holy and set apart for him to be a partaker of his holiness. And many Christians live as if there is no God. Many Christians live as if they are of the world and not of God. And God will chasten us so that we would be partakers of his holiness and be like him. He wants to sanctify us. You know, a lot of Christians are interested in salvation, in eventual glorification, but not many are interested in sanctification. Sanctification is a big part of the Christian life. Us being set aside for a purpose, and God has a purpose for us, but if we're living in sin, we cannot fulfill that purpose. So therefore, God will chasten us to compel our sanctification, to bring us back to his holiness. God's primary purpose for saving us was not to just get us to heaven. That's just the fringe benefit of being saved. It was to make us fit for fellowship with him, to make us like Jesus Christ. Now, chastening doesn't seem pleasant, does it? But there's a good purpose for it. It works good in the lives of those who are exercised thereby. Do you see how good I am today? It's because I was exercised thereby. 
quite regularly when I was a child. Amen? That's why some people walk straight and do good things. Do you remember being chastened as a child? It's changed a lot, hasn't it? Brother Leroy, has, has, has child discipline changed since you were a child? Yeah, it's changed a little bit. Back when you was a child, they probably said they had to go cut your own switch, didn't they? And it had to be at least that big around, right? It's changed. And we've gone from switchings. You know, we used to have paddlings in school. When I was in school, man, we, we, they paddled you. Y'all remember that? Boy, it'd help our schools a whole bunch if they'd bring that back, wouldn't it? Now, I remember, I remember. I hated it. I hated being paddled. My mom was my first and second grade teacher. And they would put your name on the board, and then you would get a couple of check marks, and it was three strikes, and you're out. You're out in the hallway getting the paddling. They didn't drug kids back then. Well, they, they dragged you out in the hall, uh, and they spanked you, but they didn't drug you. And I remember in my house, if you got a spanking at school, you got a spanking at home. Well, when your mom is your teacher, it's hard to get around that rule, Amen. I live with both of them and almost died with both of them right there. That was a rough, rough two years. That's why I'm so tall. I wasn't supposed to be this tall. But you remember, it's changed a lot. I remember. I remember as a child hating it. I remember one time, my greatest fear was to go to the principal's office, and one time in the fifth grade, I was acting a fool. And I had to go to the principal's office. Calvin Wade, I'll never forget that man. He only had eight fingers, but boy, he could swing a paddle. And he lit, and, and here's how they did it. It was not only painful, it was humiliating. They made you bend over and grab your ankles right there in front of God and everybody. And they whooped you. And now it's time out. Time out. Oh, well, they took the time out to beat you when I was in school. And it helped. Now, you remember all that, and you remember how unpleasant that was. But no chastening for the present time seemeth joyous, but grievous. But, man, I, I look back now, and I thank God. I thank God that I had parents who corrected me and disciplined me. I had so many friends who did not. And some of those friends have spent time in a correctional facility. I thank God that I, I had parents who disciplined me, and I thank God that he disciplined me. I need it. My heart is deceptively wicked above all things, and, and who can know it? But I thank God that he loves me enough to change me and discipline me. We look back on that correction now fondly, knowing that it did good for us. It had a purpose. So not only do we think about the reasons for chastisement, notice secondly the range of chastisement that comes from God. Now there are three levels to God's chastisement in our life. First of all, it may come by rebuke. In verse 5 he says, Nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now this is one of the ways that God deals with his children, through rebuke. This is God's verbal warning. Don't you just love the verbal warning? Isn't it good? I love the verbal warning. When the red and blue lights pull up behind me, and maybe I was hastening a little too fast, and the guy looks, and, and he says, listen, you got a good record, and uh, I don't want you got a CDL. I'm going to let you off with a verbal warning. Doesn't it make you feel good? You know what it does for me? It straightens me up. My foot gets lighter. My pace slows down. I don't feel so, so, such an urgency to get to where I'm going. The verbal warning is good. And if you can be corrected by the verbal warning, then things are good. Now, i got a preacher friend of mine who doesn't understand verbal warnings. He only understands the full chastisement punishment of God. And he pays ticket after ticket after ticket after ticket. A verbal warning does me some good. And that's the rebuke that God gives us. God will give us a rebuke. He does it through the, the indwelling Holy Spirit. It will rebuke you. When, you're, when your life is in sin, the Spirit of God living in you will rebuke you. 
He does it through the reading of the Bible. The Bible is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. When you read the Bible, it will rebuke you. Friends, if you can read the Bible and it doesn't rebuke you, then I'm amazed. God will rebuke us through a sermon. Sometimes people hate the preacher because he was preaching right at me. No, no, God is rebuking you. God is rebuking you. Paul said to Timothy, he said, preach the word, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Happy is the person, friends, happy is the person who can be corrected through a word of rebuke. Now, some children are that way, aren't they? Some children, you can say, hey, the, the universal word I found for discipline is eh. Everybody understands what that, even my dog understands what that means. Eh. I'm not even sure what language he speaks, but he understands. Eh. Now, happy is the child who can be verbally rebuked and they straight down. Some kids are that way. Some kids, you can look at them and say, hey, you knocked that off, and they will melt. I've had someone tell me, I had a guy tell me, he said, I've never had to spank my daughter. Not one time. I said, how'd you do it? Because my daughters, the Twister sisters, they, they, they need a lot of rebuking. He said, that's just how she is. That's her nature. He said, all you have to do is speak to her, and she's corrected. Well, some people aren't that way. Happy is the child of God who can be corrected through a verbal rebuke. You know, we'd be a lot better off if we would learn how to be that way, though, wouldn't we? If we could just hear the Word of God, if we could just hear a sermon, just, just read the Word of God, or just have the Spirit of God say, no, 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 and then simply say, you know what? God has spoken. It's time for correction. And repent and move on. We'd be a lot better off. Unfortunately, not everybody's that way. He may do it through rebuke. Secondly, if that doesn't work, he'll do it through restriction. If rebuke doesn't work, God will take a firmer approach to all of it. Chastening speaks of training or discipline, and it has the idea of restrictions in our lives. If a child will not be rebuked, oftentimes the next step is to give restrictions, to send them to time out or to take certain things or certain privileges away from them and restrict them from something. And kids hate that. Now, I notice that kids like spankings more than restrictions because it's over quickly and you move on. But restrictions, man, they have no end sometimes. You're grounded for a week, but uh, two weeks, but uh, three weeks. Keep talking. The restrictions are increasing. We'll just draw it out as long as you want. But sometimes God will give us restrictions too. It may be that our prayers are restricted. Our prayers and petitions are not granted it may be that blessings are withheld from us. And if restrictions don't work, then it may be by rod. In verse 6, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth. Scourgeth. That's not a pleasant word. The third step is a scourging which speaks of God physically afflicting those who continually rebel against him. Now, God doesn't want to do this. It's just like with your children. Now, don't think about God as a cosmic bully. It's just like you with your children. You don't want to spank your children. I don't want to spank my children. Every night we have a battle in my home. Every night. Every night. It, it will not fail tonight when you're resting peacefully in your recliner. Know that I'm in a battle at my home and have pity on my soul. The battle is a three- and a five-year-old girl who do not want to go to bed. To their credit, they spring up with the sun. And you'll put them in bed, you tuck them in. And you give them hugs and kisses, and they come back to the living room for hugs and kisses. And it's hard to be mad, it really is, because they're really cute. And you take them back, and you tuck them back in, and you say, all right, stay in your bed. Or there's going to be repercussions. That's a verbal warning. See, that's a rebuke. And they heed it not. Nor do they care about your verbal abuse and your rebuke. You tuck them back in, and then they come back in a little while later, very shortly thereafter, 
rubbing their eyes as if they've been asleep. Oh, I can't sleep. No, that's a lie. You're a liar, and I have to rebuke you again. Then you give them restrictions. If you don't get back in bed, then you're not going to get to go to Sherry's house tomorrow. See, we use Sherry as leverage. That's a restriction. It's a step-by-step. And listen, I don't want to spank them because they're, they, they turn you into mush. They're so cute and sweet. They're not all that sweet, really, but they're really cute. People look at my girls and they're like, oh, they're, they're so cute. I'm like, well, they're kind of like having a, a pet raccoon. They're really cute to look at until they claw your face off. But it never fails while you're all comfy in your homes. I'm in a battle, and by 10 o'clock, we have to go to the rod. We have to, you know, and you hate to spank your children and then put them in bed with a spanking. To their credit, they wake up the next morning as, as if it never happened. And I'm feeling bad that I had to spank them and send them to bed crying. But those are the steps. And it's the same thing with the children of God. God's children will, will wander off into sin, and God will rebuke them through his word, through the Holy Spirit, through preaching. Sometimes they won't heed, and sometimes God has to bring restrictions in their life. He, he shuts down the blessings, and maybe their prayers and petitions aren't heard. But friends, God, he doesn't want to. But because he loves us, God will move to scourge us if we will not repent and get right. He will. Not because he hates us, but because he loves us. The shepherds used their rod. And it's said that shepherds would have a wandering sheep. They would take the rod and break the sheep's leg if the sheep continually wandered away. That seems so cruel, doesn't it? But they would break the sheep's leg, and then they would pick up the sheep and place the sheep on their shoulders, and they would carry the sheep and care for the sheep until it was able to bear weight on that leg again and be healed. But it's also said that once the sheep was healed, it would never leave the shepherd's side again. It would not stray. God will use the rod of correction to sometimes cripple us so that he might heal us and bind us to his side where we belong. He doesn't want to, but he will. I often wondered about that passage in Psalms that says, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. How could the rod be comforting? But you know, there is some comfort. There's a level of comfort in the correction and the instruction that we get from our great shepherd. There's a level of comfort that children get from their parents in their correction. And there's a level of comfort that we get from God as well. Sometimes God will use different things to scourge us. Sometimes it's sickness that he uses to chasten his children. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you read there that many of the people in the church were sick because of how they were conducting themselves concerning the Lord's Supper. He said, for this cause, many of you are sick and some of you sleep. That means they were dead. God was chastening those church members. Now, not every church member that gets sick is suffering the chastisement of God, but God does use those things to get their attention then there are extreme measures by which god might take the life of somebody you know the bible says in john first john 5 16 that there is a sin unto death doesn't that seem strange but friends god who does not want to do that he will do that sometimes it's extreme i remember michael west telling me a story about a friend of his that was here in the church nearly 20 years ago when my dad came and did a revival, and my dad had preached a sermon about honoring your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the earth, that you could extend your life or shorten your life based upon how you treated your parents. And Michael tells the story that as my father was in uh, Pastor West and Sister Betty's home, that this young man was there, and he said, if what you said tonight is true, I won't live very long. He said, well, how is that? He said, man, I have done nothing but shame and dishonor my parents and and rebel against them. And rebelling against them is rebelling against God. And if that's true, then my life is going to be short because my life has been a total rebellion. And it was just a short time later that that young man died in a horrific, horrific accident. I wonder how many lives 
of God's people have been cut short because they could not be corrected. Because they would not be corrected. There is a sin unto death. Think about Ananias and Sapphira. They said they committed a sin unto death, did they not? God took them home right there on the spot. And so God will use the rod. That's the range of this chastisement. And lastly, think about the response to chastisement. There are basically two responses to the chastening hand of God. We're either going to get bitter or we're going to get better. Amen? He goes on in verse 15, he says, Look diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. It's important how we respond to the chastening hand of God. God's correction is sending us a message, and here's here's the message. It's a comforting message. Because if God is chastening you, Be glad and rejoice because that means that he still loves you enough to correct you. He's dealing with you as a child, as a son. Did you know that the most unhappy people in all the world are the people who are undisciplined? The undisciplined person carries around a troubled conscience. Jack Hiles, a famous preacher, Baptist preacher, told a story of a teenage boy who came to his office and asked him to spank him because he had been so rebellious and out of line he felt the need to be disciplined it's a comforting message the disciplining hand of God because he loves us and he cares for us it's a correcting message in verse 13 it says make straight paths for your feet he's correcting us make straight paths for your feet get on the straight and narrow Moses warned his people in his time, be sure that your sin will find you out. When God is chastening us, it's a correcting message to get our paths straight. And if we will heed that, he will not have to use the rod. Lastly, it's a cautioning message. He cautions us not to grow bitter at the chastening of God. You know, some teenagers grow bitter at their parents when they're disciplined, but it's only because they don't understand. They don't understand. Teenagers don't understand the correction and the direction that their parents are trying to give them. And they get older, they understand. It's amazing how your perspective changes when you get older and have children, isn't it? I had a child in 2002. Suddenly, speed limits meant something. Seat belts meant something. And all the things that I had learned in my childhood meant something. And as your children grow, you discipline them. They don't understand. They don't understand why you discipline them. But their perspective will change when they get older. I heard a story. I want to to end with this story as our piano player comes and our song leader comes. The story about a farmer who had a brush pile out by his house. and, And in that brush pile was a bird's nest. And the farmer had plans to burn that brush pile. So he went out and he destroyed the bird's nest, hoping the birds would relocate. The birds came back and they rebuilt it. The farmer went out again and destroyed the bird's nest. Over and over this happened, they keep rebuilding. Only thinking that the farmer is trying to be mean to them. But in actuality, the farmer is trying to protect them. Because he knew he was going to burn the brush pile. Friends, the same is true with God. When God deals with us, when he chastens us and disciplines us, it's not because he's trying to be mean. It's because he wants to help us. Because he loves us. Because he's doing it for our own good because he knows the danger that lies ahead just as the farmer did with the birds. Let me ask you tonight as our piano begins to play softly, how is God dealing with you today? There could be some in here that God is dealing with you as a lost person. He's 
He's convicting your heart. The Word of God convicts you as you hear about sin and chastisement and, and your, your need of a Savior, a need of correcting. If God's dealing with you that way, that's conviction. God's calling you to come and repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ. But it could be tonight that God's dealing with His children. That He deals with you as with sons. And it could be that here tonight in this very room, there's somebody who is dealing with sin, who is struggling with sin, who is burdened down, who has a sin that does so easily beset them. And maybe God's dealing with you, friends, you would do well to heed his rebuke. It would be far better to deal with your sin now when he rebukes you than to have to have God bring the rod of correction. If God's dealing with your heart tonight, would you come and take care of business with God? God does business with those who mean business. And if he's speaking to your heart, maybe there's a problem. Maybe there's issues that you can't overcome. There's no issue that God couldn't help you overcome. Listen to his voice and heed his warning.